All right, uh, thanks for coming to find the warmth of our sun here, folks. I'm Matthew Brungen, your host here at Madison 365. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Apple Podcasts. Uh, this week we're going to be, uh, like I said last week, uh, taking a bit of a, a deeper dive into uh, some aspects of critical race theory, uh, you know, and and trying to sort this out a bit more for folks. Uh, I've brought on assistant professor of educational leadership and policy analysis at the University of Wisconsin Madison, Kevin Lawrence Henry Jr. Uh, thanks for coming on here. Um, yeah, if, if you mind kind of talking a little about yourself, introducing yourself and, and a bit of your, your academic background and what makes you qualify to talk about critical race theory. Yeah. Thank, first of all, thank you so much for having me, Matt. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's really good to be a part of this conversation. And this is actually a necessary and needed conversation. Um, Absolutely. And so often what happens is that we, uh, operate in the abyss in some ways. And so yeah. I think demystifying some of the questions that people might have is, is absolutely essential. So thank you so much for having me. Um, a little bit about me, as you said, I'm assistant professor and uh, in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis at UW-Madison. Um, I am actually Madison raised, so to speak, academically. I got my PhD here. <laughs> and um, prior to returning to Wisconsin, I was a professor at the University of Arizona and a founding member of the Education Policy Center there. So um, my work really focuses on race, inequality, um, and school reform. And so, you know, part of what's happening for me is that uh, I, I study how inequality happens in schools and how it gets yeah. reproduced and what we can do about it. All right, great. Um, and and well, welcome back to to, to Madison. Um, and yeah, so we'll we'll, we'll kind of jump right in here. So one of the the kind of biggest things I see is as far as the pushback to uh, critical race theory um, and this idea that it's a, a academic theory uh, mm -hmm. and it, it falls apart when applied to the quote unquote real world. Right. And, and people have this, this trouble, like it's, it's in academia and, and things fall apart. Uh, this feels like an effective rhetorical tool to me when, when trying to dismiss it, particularly in front of people that don't know CRT. Um, with, with that in mind, how would you describe cr critical race theory to people who really haven't learned much about it or, or really anything at all about it? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I would say, first and foremost, that Critical race theory, certainly for people of color, most of the things that our grandparents have said to us, it's not something that's novel. It's not something um, that somehow is uh, this academic theory that comes from high and that everyday people can't relate. In fact, critical race theory, I would suggest, is very normal in how many people of color understand the world and make sense of the world. And so that making sense of the world is shaped by inequality and racism. Um, and so people make sense of the world through that and through those lenses. And so critical race theory for me, while there is an argument that might, one might suggest that it's a theory, it's abstract, it's actually rooted in concrete realities. It's rooted in understanding the experiences of marginalized people, people that often have been muted, have been told that their perspectives aren't important. And so critical race theory tries to elevate those voices and make certain that um, how we move forward in policy and law and education, whatever field you might be in, is attentive to and concerned with the experiences of people of color. And so it's not this on high theory where, you know, you're reading it like this doesn't make sense to me. In fact, it's probably something that makes quite a lot of sense as you're reading it or thinking through it because it often resonates with the experiences that people of color have had in the United States and abroad. Absolutely. Uh, and that, that kind of leads into, I think, some of the, the core tenets I, I covered a bit uh, um, last week. And one of the biggest ones that I've, you know, this is totally anecdotal, but I've just seen um, as, as something that people have a hard time, I, I should say white people have the hardest time mm -hmm. um, in, 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 in getting, um, grasping it, is this idea of a counter narrative, that, that use of of personal stories or individual stories, it, it, there's always this, well, it's anecdotal or well, it's one person. Um, and I think you, you really, I, I think hit it on, on the head last time. It's, 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 it's just not one story. Right. Uh, right. It's a collective of, of, of stories. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think counter narrative is, um, it's the question I think that part of what critical race theory is addressing is what we constitute as real and who gets to define what's real, what's normal, and who gets to define what's other, right? right. The idea of the counter narrative, to your point, is not, it's not an individual story. Though it may come across as this is my personal experience, but it's really about the collective group experience, how this inequality is shaped and how racism does impact the lives of large swaths of people. So, for instance, if I were to say that there are, uh, if, I, if I were to say as an African-American man um, that I've experienced um, policing and the police state and that I've had experienced police brutality and so on and thus forth. Now, while that may be something that I personally have experienced, it doesn't negate the fact that there are large numbers of African-Americans, African-American men, as well as trans folks who have experienced the same thing, right? And that pumps up against the narrative that suggests, for instance, that policing is benign, that it's the most objective thing in the world. And in fact, if we look at the statistics, we see that it's not, right? right. And so, so, so what critical race theory actually does is point out the obvious. And I think some of the pushback that we have regarding critical race theory is really a defining and really a straitjacketing of what is real and what is true. And I think we see, it, particularly in the post-Trump era, um, the remnants of that. Yeah. Um, and the critical race theory is very interested in history. It's not yeah. as if these things come about um, instantaneously or as if they just fell out of thin air, but it looks to history to help us understand the past as well as to understand the present and to suggest what might happen in the future. And so when we think about the kind of um, quieting of dissent, um, we see that this is not a new phenomenon, right? right. We can think, for instance, of J. Edgar Hoover, we can think of Mitt COINTELPRO, we can think historically about the silencing of groups that point out how inequality is operating. We saw in Nazi Germany, for instance, that intellectuals were persecuted because they challenged the narrative that was being put forth by Hitler at the right. So, I mean, these are things that I think critical race theory is interested in. Um, in as much as it's trying to tell the truth about the world that we live in. And I think some people um, are disappointed in the truth uh, or rather would, li would like the truth to be hid or silenced. Um, and that's not what critical race theory is actually interested in. Yeah. And I, I think there's a very recent uh, mention of this in, in the news is um, what's her name? Um, uh, Nicole uh, Hannah-Jones, who yes. was a tenured um yep. from and there was a lot of pushback in 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 uh um conservative spaces uh mm -hmm. about her potential tenureship at in a new position at unc right. and and you know i think that that's effectively a, a way of, of silencing and she's like the only one that, yeah. that you know in that history who wasn't tenured uh and she yeah headed up the 1619 project which was a project of a counter narrative of, yes. of what we tell ourselves about the United States. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a great point. In fact, I mean, if, if there's anyone who should be tenured, I think a MacArthur Genius Award recipient as well as a Pulitzer <laughs> Prize winner is probably someone who should have tenure, right? I mean, it's, you know, it, some of the things are so fantastic um, or fantastical in some ways that it's like you have to question, is this possible? Like, what world are we living in? I mean, right. and I think the counter narrative tries to push back against that. I mean, it's really an ethical question of whether or not we want to live in a world where there's inequality, where people are persecuted, where people are silenced. It's, it's fascinating to me that we have an amendment that allows for freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. And many people say that we care about the Constitution, we're devoted to the Constitution, yet literally we're silencing <laughs> uh, an idea, a, a set of ideas um, that help us to understand the world. And so it's, it's really, uh, it's kind of a bizarre moment that we're in um, where we have people that say, hey, look, you know, racism was bad and it's a part of how we might understand, I don't know, slavery. <laughs> and, and people are saying, no, 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 we can't talk about that. And I think that resistance is really important, right? If we go back to Germany, for instance, you don't see the Germans saying, oh, no, 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 the Holocaust was not something that we can't talk about. In fact, right. we discuss it and discuss it quite extensively 
So that by understanding that history, by understanding that context that animates the world, um, that we then better understand what we need to be doing to remedy some of the issues. And so we, there's a resistance in the United States, it seems, to um, ideas that really push for um, an ethics that is not bound by um, militarization or bound yeah. by oppression. So yeah, it, it's fascinating to me in the worst right. way. <laughs> yeah, I, I um, one of the, the the things I love about uh, like in, in that that narrative and this counter narrative if, if was James Baldwin's allusion to the lie of America and, yeah. and the lies we we, we tell ourselves uh, about this country and and I think you see that in in the pushback against CRT is that it, it's it, you know it shines a light on these lies yeah. um, and pushes back against these these narratives we tell ourselves and then people. A lot of the rhetoric, even from, you know, moderates and, and liberals, I should say, again, mostly white folks on it are going to be this, well, this, this belief, this cognitive dissonance of America's good. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm seeing this stuff in this lens that tells me this is bad. And so many of the people and institutions that we uphold did these horrible and horrific things that are up there with Nazi Germany. Yeah. Um, I was just reading something the, the other day and, and we, we knew about, uh, they, the, I knew about the, the testing of nuclear bombs on black U.S. soldiers, but they also did it uh, with uh, uh, prison um, populations. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it, that's, this was after World War II, right? So uh, when we want to talk about horrific scientific experiments, it, that's right there. Um, and, and, and so it's, it's this, this weird kind of, like, we can't say America's bad. Um, and this glossing over of, of these horrific things that, that, that have happened and a lot of people that are, you know, upheld, upheld as, as good and, and great people um, mm -hmm. took part in these, these horrific uh, uh, experiments and, and creation of, of inst horrific institutional practices. Yes. And, I, you know, I'm, I just want to add that I think your point about institutional practices is really, really important in understanding critical race theory. Critical race theory is not saying you are a bad person, white person, right? right? It's not saying, you know, you are a racist white person. It's actually more interested in structures and institutions. So how might institution reproduce inequality? How right. might a policy restructure a society? I'm actually in New Orleans right now for my birthday. I've been back, and so I get to go home. And so thinking about, for instance, like the restructuring of New Orleans following Hurricane mm -hmm. Katrina, it's not one bad person that's done this, right? It's, a, it's really a set of collective practices you know, right. from institutions. And I think your point about that is really, really important. And, you know, part of what critical risk theory is, is doing, and I, you talked about, um, you know, the, the, the idea of, uh, as you mentioned James Baldwin, but I think about Ida B. Wells, who was mm. doing the campaign against anti-lynching. Yeah. And she would say the threadbare lie. And so it's, this really, it's the thin aspects of our society that critical race theory is trying to um, make sense of, right? And to help us understand how those threads come together to weave a particular narrative that encloses, I think, many of us. And just like the clothes that are on our bodies that are made up of these threads that, you know, in some ways um, cover us, what are the right. narratives and stories that cover us as a society? And so it's, you know, going back to Wells, I mean, we can think, for instance, that during the 1920s and so on and thus forth, people were saying, oh, no, lynching is not a problem. And you have this investigative journalist who's saying, Actually, <laughs> it does exist. We have a problem here. And it's, you know, it's something, it's not that it's, it's a disparate outcome because it's not as if everyone is being lynched. It's right. actually a particular segment of society that's being lynched. And so we have to really, as Ida Blue Wilson, go through those threadbare lies that we tell ourselves yeah. um, and close us. And so clearly I could go on, but I think you might. Have <laughs> no, I think that the, the lynching, uh, I think, leads into to the next great kind of tenet that. At first, I had some, some like just kind of the, the intellectual like wrapping around it um, until I read uh, um, the example of of Amy Cooper, the uh, um, person in New York who called uh, the police on on a black man bird watching, mm -hmm. um, and and the act that that she knew that herself as a, a white woman 
um, and the use of the implication that this black man is attacking me, that police would come to protect her. And that's yeah. the idea of, of whiteness as property. Yes. Um, and that, that's one of the, like, I, I think, again, folks have, um, that, that wraparound of like, what does that mean? Like whiteness as, as property. Uh, and I, I think that talking about lynching, um, and a lot of the reasons why people are lynched leads right into that. Uh, I don't know if you want to elaborate a bit more on, on this idea of, of whiteness as, 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 as property. Yeah, no, that's, so there's, you know, part of, I think what's fueling this hysteria around critical race theory, just like the same one with Strauss, just like what we saw with the McCarthy era, is a question about how do we understand, again, that understanding that fabric of our right. society. And what's important that folks don't realize, people say, we don't want critical race theory being taught to our kids. I didn't encounter critical race theory until I was a grad student <laughs> <laughs> working on my PhD. Um, critical race theory is a theory that comes from the law. Right. It's a set of um, kind of propositions about the society that we live in to help us understand the law. That's where it started. And the idea of property is very central to the law. And so the, the concept that you're talking about was first um, introduced by Cheryl Harris, who is a law professor. And part of what she was kind of trying to disentangle was the idea of how property in the United States, in legal, in, in you know, U.S. jurisprudence, shapes our understanding of the law, and how inequality is part of that idea of property. So, I'll give you an example of what that means. A very simple example: when we saw, um, or in the midst, we're actually in the midst of this, but in, in during the Black Lives Matter protest, we would see sometimes buildings being destroyed or set afire or something to, to that extent. And people would say, oh my God, the, you know, we can't support Black Lives Matter because you know, the CVS was set on fire, <laughs> right? And that's an example of whiteness as property in the sense that the idea that the CVS has more weight than the life that was taken yeah. is the idea of whiteness as property in a very simple manner, that, that, that this institution, that this structure, that this building, this property, has inherent more rights and privileges than an actual human being, right? And so when we think about the idea of whiteness as property to your, to your earlier question, part of what it's getting at is understanding how institutions and structures um, really privilege white supremacy and privilege whiteness as a whole. And again, whiteness is not about uh, individual white person. It's about um, power. It's about inequality. Right. It's about a system. And so whiteness as property um, is really much, really trying to understand and unravel how that happens. How do we live in a society that says in the 1950s and currently, in fact, that because you live in a particular neighborhood where houses are worth $400,000 or you know $500,000, that you have better schools in that neighborhood mm. than if you live in the inner city, right? And literally the property value of those homes dictates how much money a school might get, right? Right. So physical property, as well as, you know, broader property, whether or not, the, and I'm an educationalist, so whether or not a school has, I don't know, labs in it, right? <laughs> whether or not they're books, whether people are simmering in the spring or freezing in the winter, right? These are, these are actual property things, but they also align with race and class. Right. And so, you know, we, we, we talk about this in society, in, in education, particularly in statistics, that actually two things can be true at once, right? You can have um, a society that is, says that it prides itself on you know, life, liberty, and happiness, right? Um, which is actually, if we go back to reading the, you know, the initial founding documents, it's property, life, liberty, right. and property. Um, and a society that says some people are property. Right. And so I think those distinctions matter. So I, maybe this is a convoluted way to talk about it, but it, it's, it's really a way for us to understand how embedded within our society, um, the idea of property works and more precisely how that property aligns 
with whiteness and reproduces white supremacy. And I do want to say, no, no, I think that's great. And and there's two things I want to hit. Like one, I think there's a there's a a something that really just hit me. Um, there's a powerful aspect of that that life, liberty, and pursuit of property, mm-hmm. with also the the three fifths clause, like right, the, yeah. the enshrining of of black people as property and the yeah. life like pursuit of property and who they were talking about in in being property owning white men and like there's just the and how most of these folks were slave owning white men mm-hmm. and and like that i don't know like that 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 connection there is 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 a really uh um interesting and and i think illuminating connection mm-hmm. um when when we're thinking about again some of the the, the founding ideas and and underlying ideas of, of of this country and even in that 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 whiteness of property and i think there's also a great connection to this counter narrative as well we, we see it borne out in, in in numbers um but as you know when we think about uh black property owners and and how you know the valuation of housing and houses of, of black people that own houses um and and how undervalued it is and how we you know there's over and over we see examples of black people talk telling the story of switching in a white friend or or mixed race uh couples and and it's the the you know taking down family photos and you have the the uh white person uh white partner uh yeah. being present in the valuation and how it's valued higher uh, yes. Than if you have the, the black partner present or, you know, stories, again, bringing in friends, white friends to be mm-hmm. <laughs> to pose as a property owner to get that yep. higher valuation in the housing. Yes. Um, and then you attach that to schools and, and school funding. Um, mm-hmm. And it's also the story of white flight. And, yeah. and right. And, and so how, you know, it's yeah, yeah. And I think that that idea of whiteness and that just ties it all really well to together in, in that. Yeah. And I think, you know, part of the, the challenge, I think, that we have before us is a question of truth. How right. do we, I think people say this is not true, but it means that you would have to totally ignore the history that right. exists before you and the current realities that are, are before us as well in order to make claims that suggest that we, we live in a society um, that does not um, value race, right? Part of it is this kind of idea of colorblindness. We don't see race. But then when we see, to your point, in terms of housing policy, in terms of education policy, in terms of health care, employment and jobs, we see that there are disparities that exist. And I remember there was a study that was done, in fact, in Milwaukee that focused on just something as simple as the name of applicants. Right. right? And if your name sounded ethnic, you had less likely a chance of being hired Versus right. if your name was more American or European in orientation, right? Um, and it's, 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 it's those things that I think um, part of what critical race theory is saying, hey, let's, while we have aspirations about being um, a society that is free, a society that doesn't see race, you know, people say, oh, critical race theory is against what Martin Luther King <laughs> believed. Um, and I don't think Martin Luther King was saying that we shouldn't understand how race works. I think he was actually suggesting that race is a very prominent and pronounced aspect of our society. And what we need to do is do right by people um, who are of color, who are black, versus saying we don't just see them. Right, <laughs> right, all. right. I mean, the, the latching on to the content of the characters to the color is like, but even that, he didn't say don't see the color of my skin. He says right. don't judge me by the color right. of my skin. Those are very two different types of things. And I think we have to think about is racism a character issue, yeah. right? Like if, if, you know, people say we don't not to be judged by the color of your skin. That's fair and that's fine. No one wants to be right. um, essentially seen as something um, that, that kind of excludes you right. um, from the get-go. No, no one wants that. But I think the, co- the content of the character is very important in the sense that if we see that there are policies that are hurting people, right? Are we doing the things that we need to do to remedy those policies, those laws, those approaches? If we see, for instance, uh, I have friends that are in public health and we see that their premature birth rates um, are higher and highest amongst African-American women, right? And part of what people are talking about in public health is that this is due to stressors, environmental factors, and less so about race proper right but so why are those environmental factors why what why what like you know what is the reason of those stressors what like yeah, you know? and that, that you're right and that's what race theory is trying to understand like what are the reasons behind some of the 
inequalities that we have and what do we do about it? How right. do we change it? Um, if we see this redlining occurring in a, in a city, right? If we see that gentrification is occurring and populations are being displaced, I, right. again, as I'm in New Orleans and you can see that gentrification has occurred following um, Hurricane Katrina and certain populations that are black are being and working class are being displaced. What do we do about that? And we can't say it's not happening. It, it's like if you if you're sick, you have to acknowledge that you're sick. Right. We just, yeah, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We just can't say, oh, there is no pandemic happening, which is what was actually happening during the pandemic. It actually <laughs> furthers the sickness, the illness. And so little gray series like, do we really want to be healed? Do you want to heal our society? And I think we see that resistance is saying, no, we don't want right. that. Um, I think like colorblindness gets at more so like the symptoms than, yes. than like the root, right? It's, it's like, okay, so we know there's a, we might, maybe there's a pandemic, maybe there's not. We just know people are sick. So let's, you know, let's make them feel better when they're sick um, yes, yes. instead of like investigating why they're sick. Yes. Yes. I mean, I think it's, as, as my grandmother would say, it's like part of what we do is put um, a bandaid on a gunshot wound. Right. Right. <laughs> and we're, we're bleeding <laughs> profusely um, and we're injured but we have to be willing to do the, the, the necessary surgical procedures to, right. get the, to fix the wound, to fix the pain. And I know I, I, it seems to me that we, and by we, I don't mean me, <laughs> but I think as a society, uh, the people that are resistant, I should say, um, don't want to do that, that work um, because it hurts. It, it hurts and it, it's not, it hurts because anything that is healing does hurt. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it takes some time. And I think people are reluctant um, to do that because, in fact, what we see is, is that it's maintaining inequality and power. And it pays off to do that. In yeah. fact. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's OK. I like even though like it hurts because I've seen um, people say that, that like this lens shines on like the, on the truth that it's, that the truth is somehow fatalistic. Um, and, and to me, that's a source of pain because it, you know, CRT and, and a lot of stuff, it doesn't say that we can't change. There's mm -hmm. nothing in there that's saying that, that like somehow the path, like there's no path forward. And then it's just, you know, these things are set in stone and there's nothing to do. And, 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 you know, that's the mentality of fatalism. Um, and, but that's the pain I think of, of, of pushing back against the healing in, in a sense, it's a rejection of the healing, um, yeah. because it, it hurts. Yeah. Um, and, and so this idea like this, this, this rising of, of, of particularly white folks of, of this, this fatalism of looking at this, of looking at the truth, um, that our, our current structures are, are hurting real people. Um, but yet they want to think that somehow there's like the core aspects are just and good. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it, so it, like this cognitive distance creates this, this fatalism in there. Like, well, what are, what are we to do then? Yeah. Um, there's nothing to do. If, if these things are true, then, you know, that means America's, you know, a bad nation and we can't do anything about that. Um, right. you know, and, and instead of being like, okay, this is bad. These are bad things. This is a way forward. Right. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think it's hard, uh, which, which I, I think, you know, really gets, um, I mean, to an interesting aspect that, that I've kind of questioned, I've, I've, I've posed myself a bit. Um, is, is, have you seen anything out there that explains the persistent racial disparities, uh, the persistent, um, you, you know, all the data <laughs> that doesn't end up in a place that is effectively racist, like a, a competing theory that, that explains these things that isn't CRT, that doesn't land in, well, black people are culturally less than it's a culture thing or to genetic, like everything I see is it, it falls upon uh, you know, cultural racism explanations or, or genetic mm -hmm. racism explanation, explanations instead of something that's not racist, yeah. effectively. Yeah. I mean, so if I'm understanding the question, I think, you know, part of that narrative is, is part of our general Western idea of the individual. In other right. words, all about what I do. And it has nothing to do with how my society is organized, how institutions are built, and so that cultural deprivation narrative that you're talking about, it, it's very easy to say, hey, these people are, you know, 
insufficient, they're lazy, they're, you know, they don't want to take care of their kids, as opposed to thinking about, well, how does school funding operate? Mm. Do people have um, an ability to have a living wage? Is healthcare biased, right? These are things, those are deeper and harder questions because it requires heavy lifting. It's easy to say, oh, it's their fault. Um, and so I think part of that counter narrative, as you mentioned at the outset of the interview, is to say, you know, let's, let's look at these things a bit more broadly. And I think part of what's happening is that critical race theory becomes this catch all theory um, to discuss racial inequality. Right. And critical race theory is just one approach to understanding inequality and what yeah. we do about it. And so I think what's happening, because um, you asked about if there are other theories or approaches, yeah. I think what's happening is that critical race theory becomes conflated mm. with a whole sort of anti-discrimination approaches um, you know, that are rooted in trying to uh, eradicate inequality. And so there, there's a variety of ways um, that one might, you know, examine what's happening. I mean, it's fascinating. Like someone could do organizational theory. <laughs> I don't know why there's not a, an attack, for instance, on organizational theory, um, because organizational theory is trying to understand how organizations are structured and what institutions are doing and how powers operate. I mean, it's it's this kind of hysteria around understanding inequality um, and what we do about it. And I think because race is at the center of both the, the name of the theory as well as the analysis that it offers, there is a, a type of um, uh, concern around its validity, its truthfulness, its um, its approach to understanding our society. And so I think that, you know, part of that cultural deprivation uh, theory or these ideas around deficit perspectives. Yeah. Um, and we see this a lot in education as well. Um, it, what it does is, is remove accountability and culpability um, from the those that are espousing it. And it removes uh, a level of um, desire to change. Um, and so if I get to say it's, you know, if Timmy just would, you know, stop saving his pants, that would stop all the problems of the world. It, 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 it flies in the face of reality, right? right. Can, you know, we think about, for instance, Henry Louis Gates, who's a Harvard professor who was, you know, arrested on his own property. I mean, he wasn't sagging the pants. In fact, he walks with a cane, right? Like these are not, but how do we explain that? How is it right. possible that he, you know, gets arrested and, you know, someone else doesn't, right? And so I think, Part of what I'm trying to suggest here um, is that critical race theory is, is really interested in shining a light on the experiences of marginalized, historically and presently marginalized people. And part of what it's doing in, in doing that is helping us to, I think, move beyond um, these individual narratives of um, depravity, of you know, laziness, of all these things that we know historically are stories that we tell ourselves in these right. mythologies. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think there, there are various uh, approaches that can be used to understand inequality. Um, and there are various approaches that are used to help reproduce inequality. And I think we have to decide, what do we want to do? Do we want to be on the side that says, look, we're trying to eradicate this bad boy? Or do we want to be on the side that says, it doesn't exist? <laughs> I'm sure the dinosaurs were probably saying this ice stuff. It doesn't. I mean, I don't know what, what's going on. But it, this is not this coldness that I'm feeling. It has nothing to do, uh, with reality. Right. Um, so yeah. Where I'm really curious. Where do you feel, if at all, like CRT kind of falls short in, it, in its analysis or as a lens? Uh, where would you like to either you know see it go or evolve uh, to to strengthen it? Yeah, I mean, I think part of the, the I, I think critical race theory does actually offers so many opportunities for us to understand our society. Certainly critical race theory um, offers an approach to think about racism and white supremacy. And the work of Kimberly Crenshaw is really rich because part of this, you know, this term intersectionality, for right. instance, um, is coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. And I think with critical race theory, it, its evolution 
is not only focusing on race, but thinking about how race intersects with other, or racism intersects with other forms of inequality. And so yeah. I think the future of CRT is really to, to tackle some of those issues um, and how intersectional um, inequality really converges on people's lives. And so it's not just race, but we know that it's racism as well as sexism, as well as say, you know, heteronormativity that impacts someone's lives. I, when I was uh, a grad student, I used to work on a project that was focused on homeless LGBT youth of color, right? And so like literally in that phrasing, you have a convergence of all types of identities and identities that are shaped by um, these, these processes of inequality that structure these kids' lives. So you have kids that are homeless, so that's a class issue, that are LGBT, so that's a sexuality uh, and, and, and gender issue, and of color, and then you have a race issue there. And they all converge in a very powerful way to make these children's lives miserable, right? Um, and it's not that the identity of being gay um, or trans was the issue, it was rather that they lived in a society, they live in a society that does not want to um, support those identities. And as a consequence, there are all types of um, approaches. We can see like the trans laws that are happening in yeah. schools right now that say, hey, you don't belong here. You don't right. exist. And that, that bumps up against each other. And so I think in terms of the future of CRT, I think there's going to be a lot more work that um, there's already been a generous uh, amount of work. You can think of, for instance, Adrian Dixon, who's done work on gender and uh, race in education. Um, you can think of Shamika Powell, who's done work on these. There are people that are doing these things, and I think that is where we're moving to, um, a really an analysis that helps us to understand how all of these inequalities converge and shape people's lives. Yeah. Um, before we wrap up, is there anything that you've been like itching to say, um, you know, through this all that, that hasn't quite come up in, in, in natural conversation or, or, or within the questions? Yeah, read. <laughs> I, 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 I think, you know, we have to push back against anti-intellectualism. Mm. Um, it's not nothing is inherently wrong. With reading, Americans read, right? And so and I'm saying that and I'm being cute to be acute that, you know, you'll ask someone, you know, what is critical race theory? And someone's like, I'm against it before I'm for it or whatever. You remember right. during the Bush administration? And just read it. If you, if you, it's not going to burn your eyes out. It's not going to, you know, set you ablaze. Just read what is being said. Yeah. And then make a judgment on whether or not you agree with it. But don't just take from, you know, as, as gospel, what someone says, um, it's OK to think. And I think we have to be willing to think through the hard things. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm a teacher. Um, and so I think that thinking is important. And I don't think we should abdicate um, our ability to think and to read and to understand. That's what separates us apparently as a species from other animals, right? <laughs> so I think we, we really have to be willing to um, engage ideas. I mean, I think yeah. this, this, I, this, this notion that nothing else matters by what is said um, and it's only one truth in that regard is a very dangerous um, idea. Yeah. And so I, I wanna cautious, caution us to, um, Bring back reading. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, and not only bring back reading, bring back comprehension. Mm. These are things that matter. Um, <laughs> because it gets very messy if we just say, here it is. I mean, this right. is, life is not, in fact, a reality TV show. Right. Um, and so I, I, I just want people to read again uh, <laughs> and to, to, to think through the things that they're hearing. And so there's a whole host of resources for folks if they're interested. Um, and I'm gonna put a shameless plug. You can also take a class with me um, if you have questions about race and equality um, because these, these, the work is, is there for us to do. Yeah. So, um, I think it's, it's, it's not gonna hurt you to be exposed to these things. It's, no. it's, it's not like, you know, like it, it's, it's so easy to um, continue to listen to people that confirm your bias. Like that's, yes. that's, the, that's the easiest thing to do. The yeah. hardest thing to do is going to pick up a book by the people that have developed 
these ideas, these theories, and these analyses that challenge your perception of, of the world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been watching, as, as I say, read, I've been watching this uh, series on Einstein. Um, and I think about the pushback Einstein had yeah. regarding the theory of relativity. Um, and it's you know, just, it's not to say that theory of relativity is uh, one-to-one to critical race theory, but the, I, the point is that the idea that challenges what you think actually could very well be the truth. <laughs> and we might need to take a moment to sit with that um, in order to um, really galvanize ourselves as a society so that we can really do the work that's necessary. And so I think what critical race theory is simply just saying, hey, do you want to do the work? Because if you want to, there are people that are willing to. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, thanks for coming on. Uh, I think we're going to be wrapping up right there. I think that's a great ending spot. Um, it, it, it's been a pleasure and, um, you know, hope, uh, hope to see you around town as, as, as things open up. Yes, I, I certainly hope to see you. And thank you so much for having me today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that's it, folks. Thanks for coming to Finding Warmth of Our Son. Um, here at Madison 365, I'm Matthew Brown, your host. We just had Kevin Lawrence Henry Jr., uh, assistant professor here at UW Madison of ELPA. Um, and you can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts. And hope you guys have a great week. Thank you. This is 365 Media.